In October of 1972, a Japanese firm that goes by the name of Panasonic today released a mid-range turntable with direct drive technology. This turntable would go on to change absolutely everything and pave the way for a new era of DJs. Of course, I'm talking about the Technics SL1200. Hi guys, welcome back to Crossfader. My name is DJ Holland and today on Trying and Tested, we're taking a look back at the most important piece of DJ hardware there has ever been, the Technics SL1200 series. Why was this series of turntables so important? Well, it was the first time DJs had had access to direct drive. This gave us great torque and allowed the platter to get up to speed very, very quickly. You see, back in the day when there were belt-driven turntables, these were better for acoustic purposes, but it meant that the rubber band that drove the turntable platter would take a long time to get it up to speed. So any input a DJ would make on the platter itself, maybe scrubbing it to slow it down, or twisting the spindle to speed the platter up, that action would take a while to correspond and that would engage a lot of wow and a lot of flutter. Now, back in the days of playing vinyl, when you sped up a record or slowed it down, the pitch would change because this playback speed was changing. There was no such thing as master tempo or pitch lock as we know it in the modern day. So a turntable that could keep its speed and get back up to speed very quickly when you make adjustments was vital for making sure the audio quality remained high throughout the playback and the performance. So the first time DJs laid their hands on the SL1200 back in 1972, this was revolutionary. Being able to press play and the turntable get up to speed instantaneously was brilliant and it became very popular with the radio DJs and broadcast DJs back in the day. Now in 1978 the Mark II edition of the SL1200 came along. This was the turntable that literally paved the way for modern day DJs. You see before the Mark II the 1200 had showcased just what direct drive technology could do for DJs but it wasn't quite perfect. The Mark II brought with it a pitch fader. The ability to change the playback speed accurately and quickly just by moving a fader. It's something we all take for granted in the modern day, but this was the first time we'd seen it. Add to that the fantastic quartz drive motor accurately playing back that platter at 33.3 RPM or 45 when left at zero. This was a very accurate turntable and one that allowed for perfect beat matching. This literally paved the way for the modern day DJ. It played a pivotal role in DJing and a pivotal role in hip hop. Modern day culture would not have been the same without the Mark II edition of the SL1200. Now over here in Europe, it sold as a 1210. The main differences between the SL1200 and the 1210 is the darker paint job and the ability to change the voltage from 110 up to 240 volts. Now, although many models followed the Mark II, it remained in production all the way until 2010 when the entire SL1200 range was finally discontinued. This turntable was so pivotal, so instrumental, and so important to the way we do things as modern DJs. I've already mentioned that it was the first time we'd seen a pitch fader, but when you add that to the fact that this uh, turntable had great acoustic properties, great internal uh, dampening. It stood on four feet that allowed the turntable to float and absorb resonant frequencies and knocks. Technics actually sold this turntable with the strap line strong enough to take a disco beat and accurate enough to keep it. And that is exactly why DJs flocked to this turntable. For the first time, we had a turntable that was strong enough to take the frequencies of being played in a loud, noisy environment, such as a bar or nightclub, and accurate enough with that quartz drive technology and the direct drive motor in that turntable, it was accurate enough to take scratching, to take pitch bending, to allow the DJ to beat match. It was 
flawless. And these things were built like tanks. They just kept going. I'm sure if you take a look in the comments below, there will be plenty of DJs telling you how they've had their original 1970s model all the way since back then, and they're still going strong to this day. These turntables have just been so important. And I know so many beginner DJs like myself, I was born in the 1990s, I went out and I've bought a set of 1210s that are older than me. That's how important the Mark II was to the industry as a whole. That being said, Tenix did make small incremental updates to the 1200 line of players. Most of them did look much like the 1200s and 1210s. Again, the 1200 being the silver model traditionally sold in America and Japan, the 1210 being the European model which featured a darker color and a switchable line voltage. In 1989, the Mark III D came along. This was for the Japanese market. It featured not too many changes, but it featured gold RCA uh, cables, a foil sticker on the back, and a darker matte black finish. In 1996, the 1200 celebrated its 25th anniversary, and to celebrate it, Technics released a limited edition black and gold model. This was well sought after with only 10,000 models being made and every single one of them being sold out within the first year. In the same year, we got the Mark IV 1200 SL. This was a uh, turntable aimed more at the audiophile market than the DJ and featured removable RCA cables and a playback speed of 78 RPM. In 1997, Technics returned with the SL1200M3D. This turntable revised the pitch fader. It removed the click, the indent when you reach zero, replacing it with a reset button, which could be activated at any point in the pitch fader's range. This allowed for tighter control over the platter and allowed DJs to get more precise with their beat matching. Other small changes did come along with this model, including the strobe light changing color to a more orangey hue and the problematic dust cover hinges being completely removed. In 2002, two more models were released. The Mark V most notably replaced the problematic dust covers with magnetic models to stop the hinges snapping. The target light was replaced with a white LED and the anti-skating was updated to feature 0 to 6 grams of tracking force from the original naught to three grams that had been in models previous. The M5G model was released in the same year to celebrate 30 years of this legendary turntable. Along with a new paint job and blue LED lighting, the pitch fader received an update, allowing it to also have a plus 16 pitch range. Normal, older SL1200s only had an 8% pitch range, but this was the first time we had the option to double that to 16, allowing DJs to have a wider range of BPMs available to them. That very same M5G model, just two years later, was re-released with a black and gold paint job, once again being a limited edition run of SL1200 Golds. This time though, unlike the original 10,000, there was only 3,000 models released, making them one of the most desirable models of the 1200s out there in the wild. In 2007, the Mark VI came along. Technics went under the hood of this turntable, updated the wiring, the pitch control, the dampening, and also the turn arm assembly just basically making small incremental updates to increase the accuracy and the dampening within the turntable. That very same year, the Mark VI K1 turntable was released. This was a limited edition run to celebrate the 35th anniversary of the SL1200 and basically was a Mark VI, but with a matte black paint job. However, sadly, this would be the last model from the original SL1200 series. Three years later, in 2010, Panasonic decided that the Technics SL1200 had run its course. You see, in 2010, the digital era was fully upon us. The CDJ2000 had just come along, which allowed DJs to use USBs. DVS had been around a little while, and just outside the DJ industry, music as a whole had moved on. If you did need a set of turntables, well, there was over 30 years worth of SL1200s out there in the marketplace. Sales were low, and as such, 
Panasonic decided it was time to kill off the SL1200. But what a life it had. This turntable not only changed the way we do things, it influenced the generations of DJs to come. It was influential, it was groundbreaking, and over the years, the small incremental upgrades meant that this turntable had remained at the forefront of the best turntables DJs could use. Many people had come along and tried to copy and try to steal the Technics crown, but even to this day, in 2020 at the time of filming, there's only one turntable every DJ knows about. There's only one turntable every DJ cares about. That is the SL1200. It really was that fundamental in the building blocks of DJ. The 1200 series was that influential, and that groundbreaking, that even after its discontinuation in 2010, from the ashes of this legendary turntable became a new market. Known in the industry as a super OEM, a company from Taiwan called Hanpin designed a turntable based very heavily on the original design of the 1200 series with the buttons in the same places, the great direct drive um, motor design and the same pitch fader uh, controls. They designed this blueprint and then allowed other companies and other DJ brands to come along and cherry pick little features designing and creating their own turntables that essentially were based on the blueprints of the 1200s. Companies such as Audio Technica, Stanton, Reloop, and Pioneer all went to Hampin and had a turntable designed and created based on the blueprint and the foundation of a 1200. Now, some of these um, Companies cherry-picked new features like removable RCAs. Some of them added different pitch faders and different controls. But essentially, all these turntables that came after the 1200 were based on the same designs of a 1200. And thankfully, Panasonic grew wise to this. With all these copycat turntables on the marketplace, there was a resurgence in vinyl that no one really saw coming. As such, there was an online petition for Panasonic to bring back the Technics 1210. And six years after the discontinuation, Technics returned in 2016 with the 1200 GAE. This was called the Grand Class 1200. It was a limited edition run to celebrate 50 years of Technics turntables. And it was released with just 1200 models being available to the public. Now these 1200 models cost $4,000 each. They were audiophile quality. So these were very expensive, great sounding collector's items. They were not the DJ turntable that everyone was hoping was coming back. The same year, Technics did release the SL1200G, which was a non-limited run, but this was still very expensive and still wasn't really what DJs were after. There were certain aspects of the design, such as the uh, bass not being very good at handling resonant frequencies, um, that really just meant that DJs weren't happy with this turntable. A lot of reviews at the time were just not impressed and with the 1200 Mark IIs still being readily available second hand, you know, people weren't really going to go out and spend a lot of money on a turntable that even after all these years wasn't as good as the models that had come before it. So the SL1200G wasn't quite the turntable DJs were hoping for. But in 2019 at the CES show, Tenex returned with the Mark VII, a SL1200 that was designed and aimed at DJs. A turntable would right the wrongs of the previous model. Now this turntable came in at a more reasonable £799 retail price here in the UK. It came with some new features and a new look. The entire turntable was now matte black, including the uh, tone arm, looked very stealthy. You could remove the platter and change settings Underneath the platter, which changed the settings within the deck, we could change from red LED lighting to blue LED lighting. There was the ability to enable reverse platter movement. You could even change the torque settings of the motors. It was a great turntable. However, it did feel cheaper than the models that had come before it. 
You see, it was a lot lighter and the buttons didn't have the same quality feel. And a lot of people for that reason still don't hold the Mark 7 in the same regard as they do the older models. You see, the Mark 7, unlike the older models, was made in Malaysia, whereas these were made in Japan. So the Mark 7 is out, it is still a great turntable, but it's not quite as legendary as say the Mark II, which of course was made up until 2010. So here we are in 2020, 40 years after these turntables came along and changed our industry for the better. These really are legendary players and they really do deserve the credit and respect they get. You know, they are still players from the 70s that are playing just fine today. So would I recommend going out and buying an SL1200 or a 1210 in 2020? Well, yes, of course I would. These things are brilliant. They really, really are that good. There's so many things that make these so legendary and there's a good reason why Technics had to bring them back and start making new ones. They really are that good. However, if you're going to go out and buy a set of SL1200s, if you're buying a Mark 7, it's brand new. You don't have to worry about anything. But if you're going to look at an older model, there's a few things you need to be aware about. First of all, these are nearly 40 years old. So things are gonna wear. There's plenty of service centers around. So, you know, Google your local Technics um, service center. There's a lot of great independent companies out there as well. Um, things to look out for, pitch faders. The pitch faders can wear out uh, over time, especially the ones with the click in the middle. They end up building up a bit of a dead zone sometimes. So even when you're slightly off the zero position, it doesn't change the playback speed. Now, the dots on the outside of the platter are actually used to tell if the playback is correct. This light in the on-off switch is actually a strobe. And if you look at the player, you'll notice on this little diagram just down here, it tells you which dot should be constantly shown at what playback speed. So the big dot in the center, if you can see that permanently, when you're playing at zero, that means the deck is calibrated correctly. When you speed up to 45 RPM, it's the dot above and so forth. It's really handy to know that little trick. So when you're going out and buying a deck, you know if the pitch fader and the motor are calibrated correctly. The other thing to check on these decks is the RCA cable and the earth lead. Now, the Mark 7 has removable and replaceable uh, RCA cables and earth lead, but the originals do not and these do wear over time. So make sure you've got a good, strong connection from these. If not, again, you can go get these serviced or changed out. There's a lot of companies now that make uh, modifications to these decks to enable um, replaceable cables to be fitted. However, these can sometimes have a detrimental effect on the audio quality. So it's completely up to you what matters to you more but be wary of decks that have already had the conversion done. And if they have had a conversion done, do ask who did it and what parts were used. Another popular mod is the internal uh, grounding. Again, this can really have a negative effect on the sound quality. So make sure you do your homework before purchasing a set of decks that have had modifications done to them. A good indication of a deck that's previously been serviced or repaired is screws on the bottom base plate. There's a lot of screws here, and sometimes when there's been a sloppy repair, these screws haven't been replaced properly and are missing. So make sure you, make, you check every single screw to see if there's been any change to the deck previously. Another top uh, area to check is around the tone arm assembly up top. Make sure the anti-skate mechanism is working. Make sure the uh, tone arm raise and lift mechanism is still working and that everything is still able to be adjusted. These can seize over time with a buildup of dirt. Again, it's something that's quite easily fixed at a service center, but it's money you'll be going out and having to spend. The connection between the head shell and the tone arm is also known for building up dirt and becoming a bit of a problem area. So make sure that everything is connected and the sound quality coming from your tone arm is good and giving you strong signal. Finally, the platter bearings can wear and the motor can wear if they're not oiled and serviced every so often. So make sure you grab hold of the platter, have a feel around, give it a spin, make sure that, that platter bearing is smooth and not gritting. You know, there's no any uh, grit or um, resistance in that bearing. 
Apart from that, these are very, very, very strong decks. I'm sure DJs in the comments will be telling you stories of just how battered these decks can get and still be running just fine. These are a legendary player. I cannot emphasize how much the 1210 shaped everything in DJ. Let us know in the comments below your thoughts on this incredible deck. Give this video a thumbs up if you've enjoyed it. Subscribe for more content just like this and make sure you hit that bell icon so you're notified when we make more videos just like this one. Thank you for watching. I know it's been a long video, but we had a lot to cover. And yeah, what a player, what a player. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in another video sometime soon. Take care.